pretty calming. Yeah, actually, it's it's a really calming sound. You know what's not so calm? CO2. Bad stuff. Basically, one of the most important issues that we deal with with our oceans today is the increasing amount of CO2 that our oceans absorb from the atmosphere. At this point in time, the oceans currently absorb about maybe a third of the CO2 that humans emit into the atmosphere. Roughly about 22 million tons a day. It's wild. Definitely not as calm as the sun, right? You know, so one of the effects of increased CO2 absorption by the oceans is the measurable, uh, basically, decrease in pH. The oceans are getting more acidic. And for the most part, millions of years and over, you know, over the past Earth history, the idea is, you know, pH, it was all kept in check. Acids were emitted by volcanoes, and alkaline and basic substances were always uh, kind of like keeping that in check by the weathering of rock. And in the, you know, basically since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, about the 1800s, we've basically just been throwing all this CO2 into the atmosphere. About, like I said, about 22 million tons a day, and it's allowed for large-scale advances in human industry and technologies. And the global increase in, in, in uh, industrialization has just caused these CO2 emissions to skyrocket. And the world's oceans are basically acting as a carbon storehouse for all of this CO2. And for the most part, it's lowering the water pH to the point to where a lot of different shell-forming organisms are struggling to actually form these shells in development. And carbonic acid is what's formed, and that's what causes the pH to lower. Hydrogen ions basically combine with the carbonate in the seawater to form bicarbonate, which is not as easily uh, escapable back into the uh, global car carbon cycle. So basically, this carbon gets absorbed into the ocean waters, and it's almost stuck there. So there are sediments called pelagic sediments that are deposited in deep ocean basins. Even though there are many different types of sediments, the one we plan to focus on are called tests, which are once shells of living organisms or biogenous sediments. These tests will sink to the bottom of the ocean floor after the organism dies, and these tests have either a calcium carbonate or a silica consistency. And for the sake of this argument, on carbon dioxide levels, we will focus on the calcium carbonate. So, it's something like this, it's a little bit smaller, but as it goes down the water column, is something is like this, fine sediment. So this calcium carbonate will sink down the water column as it dissolves. The calcium or the carbon dioxide in the water will dissolve the shell so that as the shell dissolves it acts as a type of buffer for the acidity. This is the point in which the water column called the calcium carbonate compensation depth. This depth is around 3,500 feet down the Pacific Ocean and about 20,000 feet in the Atlantic Ocean. At this depth is where the tests are completely dissolved and the acidity above this point is somewhat neutralized. So as you can see, I'm going to use vinegar here as the ocean water. And this is the pelagic sediment which will go down and as the CO2, or as this goes down, the CO2 in the water will dissolve. This is a little exaggerated, but this is the type of system that is going on in the ocean. We have to try and keep the amount of CO2 down. There's a new wave of an old fad hitting the coast of the Gulf of Mexico. It's called eutrophication. Have you heard about it? I have. Well, it's when there's too many nutrients in the water so the algae blooms. Oh my goodness, isn't that a good thing? Yes, algae is kind of like hair. If you have enough hair in the right places, then it's nice. But if it's all in the wrong places, then it's not nice. Just the same way, a lot of algae in the right places can be a good thing. They provide food for the fish, and we eat the fish. But too much algae means hypoxia. That means there's not enough oxygen in the water. That happens because although algae produces oxygen, when the algae dies, what happens is it decomposes and that takes up the oxygen in the water. So then what happens is it creates these things called dead zones in the water. Now fish also need oxygen to survive. 
But these dead zones have very little oxygen and very little can survive in those waters. So look, this is America right here. This, uh, that's America. And then we have the Mississippi, something like that. And then we have all these towns and stuff all along the Mississippi, you see that. And then they have sewage and they have fertilizers and they all just dump out here into the Gulf. Now this whole thing is just covered with algae. That's nasty, that's not natural, that's bad. Now, data says that from 1950s to the 1980s, there's been about a four-fold increase in nutrients. Now, those are the nitrogen and phosphorus-based nutrients that we use on the farms to grow stuff like cows. Also, in the 1960s, there were only a reported 10 cases of these eutrophication dead zones. But now, in 2006, well, it's actually 2013, but in 2006, there have been 405 cases. That's a lot more than 10. You see that? 10 is, is good, and then 405 is bad. Um, and that's what the data shows. Now, a lot of this is probably because we are using so many nutrients in these places and all the cities just dump their stuff into the Mississippi River and it comes out to the Gulf of Mexico and hence it just creates all this crap. And then what happens is the ocean currents come in and they just spread the nutrients and algae everywhere. So it just keeps spreading and this is bad for the environment. Not only is it bad for the environment, it kills all the fish that we eat. So the fishermen here are sad, the fishermen here are sad because there's no fish. And that's why human beings are terrible for the sea. The major threat to the oceans and its ecosystems is climate change. Although natural phenomena, increased emissions and consumption are accelerating these changes. In July of 2009, the ocean was a full degree warmer at 62 and a half degrees than the 20th century average. In addition, sea levels are expected to rise over a foot and a half in the next 80 years, which in some areas can be catastrophic. Marine organisms are thought to be more sensitive to this change in sea temperature than terrestrial species. For example, coral, among others, is particularly vulnerable to rising sea temperatures since they are immobile and therefore experience a bleaching effect. In addition, the melting of the polar ice caps has a large effect on the salinity of the ocean water. The melting of the ice will dilute the seawater. Since the ice is no longer maintained, it can no longer sustain flow by the difference in densities of salt water and fresh water. Not only are the seas directly affected by climate change, but so is the weather. Stronger and fiercer storms are expected to be another unwelcoming outcome of the ever-changing atmospheric conditions. Ultimately, warmer ocean temperatures and higher sea levels have the ability to alter ocean circulation and current flow, increase the frequency and intensity of storms, and alter habitats and impact weather worldwide. Unfortunately though, the only way to reduce ocean temperatures is to dramatically rein in our emissions of greenhouse gases. However, even if we immediately dropped carbon dioxide emissions to zero, the gases we've already released would take decades or longer to dissipate. Unfortunately, though, the only way to reduce ocean temperatures is to dramatically rein in our emission of greenhouse gases. However, even if we immediately dropped carbon dioxide emissions to zero, the gases we've already released would take decades or longer to dissipate. Basically, salinity rises when more water is evaporating and less water is coming in through precipitation. I'm here to talk to you about salinity. What is key about salinity isn't the effect it has on the ocean, but what it's a strong indicator of, which is that humans have been affecting global hydrological cycles and the environment. What scientists have done is compared the changes that we know should have occurred in salinity to the actual changes that have been measured throughout recent times. What we found is that the changes are anthropogenic in nature. A lot of people like to say that climate change is part of natural cycles, but when compared to what the salinity levels should have been, 
We found that the natural cycles can't account for the changes that have occurred. The ocean is telling us that we're having a major effect on the environment. The real issue is what happens when the hydrological system continues to intensify in this way. In dry areas, we're going to see more drought and desertification. In already wet areas, we're going to see more extreme weather events and natural disasters. Recently, salinity has been used to create projections of the future. And what we're finding is that the changes are going to be far more intense than we initially thought. If we don't change the way we interact with the environment, water will be our downfall. Which are once shells of living organisms or biogenous 